All right. A very warm welcome to all of you in our next session of Employee Center Academy. Today, we will be focusing on design techniques for kickstarting your Employee Center deployment. So for those of you who have joined this for the first time, I just want to set some more context. So Employee Center Academy is um, a series of sessions. We do this monthly. And it is your time with the product team and ServiceNow experts. So please use this session to ask your questions, interact. We love it when you raise your hand and you pause and you like you know, say that um, we, we have a comment. Um, please, please do that as we go through this session. We're trying to make sure this is not a presentation. We configure the product live and it makes sense. Um, and uh, we want this to be more like a workshop or more like a, a, your time to engage with us. And like I said, these are monthly sessions. We, we do this every month, but our December one is canceled just because of the holiday season. And we will come back again in January with our um, new topic for 2023. Now, um, if you have registered for Academy sessions, you would, um, you would essentially be registered for all the sessions. So make sure you have the calendar invites added into your uh, calendar and uh, you would be receiving um, email updates by from Zoom talking about the next, um, the next topic if you're not on community and, and following it over there. But ultimately you can go in both in community and your emails to get the next topic. In terms of logistics, we do have a Q&A panel and we all our experts on the call today, we will be manning it very closely. So please post all your questions there and use the Q&A panel specifically for questions and not the chat. Chat is more for your comments. We, you, as you saw, there is a representation like from around the world. So please engage, um, add your comments, add your thoughts. Um, everyone on this call will appreciate it. And the slides, and the video recording for this will be available for you. So don't worry about uh, taking notes, taking screenshots. Um, it does take a couple of days um, or a little bit here and there to get the video up on YouTube, but it will be on YouTube as well as on our community page. So um, everything from Q and A slides and videos will be uh, available for you after the session. Some of the resources, um, you uh, hopefully are familiar with our Employee Center community. We just recently did a revamp of it. Um, so things are still settling down over there, but please use that as your channel for getting um, or self-serving yourself for any best practices or keeping up to date with events like this. We also have a now learning course um, focused on Employee Center. Um, now create resources which help you self-implement and a whole YouTube playlist, which is recordings of these events um, available for you. We will have additional resources highlighted at the end, um, which will be more specific to our discussion today, but just wanted to highlight these more broadly from an Employee Center perspective. All right, so let's get into our topic. So our today's topic, like I mentioned, is design techniques for kickstarting your Employee Center deployment. And we get so many questions from organizations who are doing this on how do we get started? What are the most important thing? What are the techniques that I could use to, um, to essentially build alignment across my stakeholders, design an MVP and so on? In fact, um, I wanna expand this and say, it's not just for those who are kickstarting their deployment, but as they are thinking about their next iteration, the techniques that we will talk about today are equally important for that as well. We have two really awesome experts um, in this field joining us today. So first is AJ, who, um, who is our in-house expert for everything related to portal um, and also design. And, and Nicole, who is joining from our workflow, workflow design studio, um, who is a special, that, which is a special team focusing on doing design workshops with customers and helping them create that, you know, that unique design that they want. So AJ, you wanna add to that introduction and then Nicole, you can. Sure. Um, I am actually focused on experience enablement. So sessions like these and helping our customers and partners understand how to apply UX to their service now implementations, whether that's design best practices or usability testing techniques. We're here to really help educate the community on how to bring that in and not just let it be a developer centric approach to implementation. So very happy to be here. 
Um, hi, I'm Nicole, and thank you so much for having us. Um, my team works directly with customers on their complex challenges to help them kickstart and get that vision kind of mapped and using service blueprinting and um, a cross-functional, you could call it growth hacking or lean UX kind of approach. So thanks so much for having us. It's great to be here. Thanks, Nicole. Thanks, AJ. And just to add, my name is Pooja Gupta. I am the host for uh, Employee Center Academy session. So you will see or you will hear my voice every time we do these. Um, and I'm super happy to have Nicole and AJ join us today for this for this session. So here's what we will do. We will first start with just some high level overview of uh, service delivery trends and best practices. Uh, when it comes to like addressing those um, service delivery use cases. Then Nicole will dive deep into design thinking techniques that they use uh, within the work, um, the workplace design studio. And then we will also cover some techniques for building an employee centric taxonomy, which I know a lot of you are focused on. And then we will wind up with some additional resources. And as I just quick again reminder, please keep asking your questions in Q&A and we will have additional time in the end for open okay. Q&A as well. All right, so AJ, over to you. All righty, thank you so much, Pooja and Nicole for having me. So one of the things I've been spending a lot of time thinking about with my team is what are some best practices we can impart on customers when designing a outstanding self-service experience that their users find delight in using? And so when we do that, we want to start in the research. And so we're very fortunate that at ServiceNow in our experience organization, we have a large insights team that conducts research with our customers, uh, with our partners to understand trends in a specific market. And so as we think about the evolution of Employee Center, we do research on how employees expect to interact with their company when they need services. And there are really three key themes that came out of that research that help drive how we think about best practices. The first one is anytime, anywhere access. I should be able to interact with HR, IT, facilities, et cetera. If I'm at my desk, if I'm on the subway, if I'm on a bus, if I'm in the cafeteria, I shouldn't be restricted to only being able to interact with these service providers when I'm sitting at my desk plugged into the network. I want flexibility in how I interact. So mobile is very key in that experience. I'm sure we're all hearing this a lot in that our consumer experiences, our experiences with our smartphones and our dinner delivery services or vehicle ride sharing services are shaping the expectations that our employees have for interacting with IT and other groups. So we really need to up-level our experiences to be as good, if not better, than those consumer experiences that people are interacting with inside and outside of work. And ultimately, for many reasons, cost savings, efficiency, getting people back to work, self-service is critical to the success of the businesses we all work for. If you think about the reason somebody comes to Employee Center, it's because typically it's because something is interrupting their ability to do the job they were hired for. So the ability to self-serve and get back to work is critical to making sure people are doing what we are asking them to do when we hire them into our businesses. Next slide, please. Now, unfortunately, there's some challenges that we continuously see as we embark on these self-service journeys. Uh, these five are very common. One is hard to find content. We often map legacy content structures when we move from one platform to another. We deal with politics and we're forced to design our content to map our org charts. And employees, employees especially new employees, don't know those structures. They don't know the jargon. They don't know the lingo. So they struggle to find content in these large taxonomies. Rel related to that is search relevancy, is the ability to search rather than browse using search to find content. Remember, people typically have wonderful search experiences with Google and other platforms like Amazon or eBay to find things they need, those consumer experiences. But for whatever reason, because we don't invest the time, Search is not as good when we get into these self-serve platforms in the workplace. Going even deeper and more specific, we know a lot about our employees, but we often don't use that to shape the experiences that they have when they come into self-serve. I'll tell one quick story. I was working with a large retail chain and I logged into their portal impersonating a loss prevention specialist at a store in Connecticut. And the first six catalog items he saw all had to do with access to SAP. 
he didn't even know what those initials stood for. Yet that was what his first experience and impression of the self-service experience was at that retailer. Another challenge is, as I interact with these digital tools, if they don't use consistent language and consistent navigation, I'm constantly having to reset my expectations. My mental model would be the language we use in UX for how to interact with these platforms. And that creates friction in my efficiency of getting work done. And then ultimately, one of the biggest challenges is confidence. If you're asking me to self-serve, but over and over again, I submit a ticket and it disappears into a black hole, I'm more likely to find other means of resolving my issue. So low confidence in ticket fulfillment is, a, is a, something that prevents adoption of self-service. So these all generate a series of user needs, please click, that ultimately drive our best practices. And you'll see each of these user needs crop up in the five best practices I'm about to review. Providing content that's easily discoverable, help me find information I need quickly, <laughs> personalize that content based on my role, location, department, and job type, find support easily in a consistent way, whether I'm interacting at my desk, on my phone, on my tablet, and then ultimately give me confidence that my issue is going to be resolved. And that often comes from past experiences. Next slide, please. So the way I'm gonna talk about each of these best practices is I'm gonna state it, I'm gonna describe it, and then in the content, and I think you'll get this later, I try and connect each best practice to actual capabilities on ServiceNow so that you have some guidance on how to act on these best practices. So one of the most important things any customer can do as they move from employee service center to employee center, or they move from some other platform to ServiceNow is understand how things are going today. Are users able to find content? Is the language we're using? Are there stale items in your catalog or knowledge base that aren't relevant? How do you learn more about what is most frustrating to your users? So it's not just new technology and that's exciting. There's actually a dramatic improvement in the experience you're delivering as you move to a new platform or capability like Employee Center. And you can see here, there are a set of capabilities and this even can be updated more with user experience analytics to start understanding how your employees, your customers are using ServiceNow today to then drive decisions and priorities as you move on to the new platform. Next slide, please. If you look at some of the most successful consumer facing companies like Amazon, their website is not that beautiful. It's overwhelming. There's a ton of content. I often don't know where to go. Now I can rely on search, that's very reliable, but what differentiates them from their competitors is that package arrives before I click submit. I exaggerate, but we all have that experience where we're like, how did this get here so fast? That's because they've invested millions of dollars in acquisitions and process improvement and logistics to nail the service delivery part. And that's where we need to focus, not on the colors, not on the fonts, but actually on what happens when I click submit on a request to make sure that it goes through the process in the most efficient and effective way, it gets to the right team, there's automation used, et cetera, to actually efficiently fulfill that request. Next slide, please. We also need to focus on making sure information finds the user. We, we talked about this earlier in some of the challenges and pain points, but it's really critical that we leverage things like user criteria to say, oh, you're an accountant at our company. These are typical catalog items that are relevant for you. You are based in Israel, so you can only pick from these. This is a real experience I had when I started at ServiceNow before we started using user criteria. I went to order my monitor as a remote employee, and there were 15 monitors in the catalog. 13 of them in the title had some country only in, the, in parentheses in the title. So it'd say, you know, India only, UK only, so ultimately there are actually two monitors, only two monitors I could order, but I had to filter through that list of 15, even though the system knew all these things about me. So it takes some effort and it takes some work to implement things like user criteria, but it helps your users get back to their jobs faster because they're filtering through less content. So that's something else that's very important. Next slide, please. In every content project I've worked on in my 15 years of doing UX, this is one of the most challenging things because you're fighting egos here. 
companies or VPs want their group name on the homepage. They want their special project in the catalog. And that's great for their ego, but it's not actually great for users getting their work done. And again, getting back to work. So finding ways to understand how your users expect to navigate your content is really critical. Staying away from code names for special projects, staying away from acronyms, just like good content writing skills are also really important to helping your users find the content and get back to work as quickly as possible. You have to remember that you're in a bubble when you're designing, employ designing and creating this experience because you're living it. But if you're at a large organization with thousands of employees, those people don't even know what you're up to. They're off doing their jobs. They're you know, fixing a pipe on an oil rig or restocking shelves on a, on a, in an aisle in a store. They aren't learning all this special language that you get to learn as a special team working on this project. So you can't let that stuff manifest in the actual experience. Next slide, please. And, and just like we talk about that in terms of naming content and using jargon, we see this also being really important is how you ask for information from your users. When you present a form as part of a catalog item or you're writing a knowledge article, understand the information and skill and knowledge that the user is bringing to that form. Don't ask complicated questions that they don't have to save IT's time where, where something might be easier for IT to get. Ask things consistently. Um, I remember I was looking at one customer's catalog at one point and in five different catalog items, they asked for the user's user ID in different ways. It was screen name, it was user ID, it was NT ID from back in the Windows NT days. It was email address. It was just these inconsistent ways of asking for something that technically the system already knew. So there are ways in service now to try and enforce that consistency. So if you want to make sure you always ask for an address in the same way, create a variable set that can be reused across catalog items. That's your address variable set. And then you can start building consistency into your experience. So this helps with consistency, which we talked about earlier as a user need. It also helps with users efficiently avoiding friction and quickly filling out and giving you accurate information. Because otherwise, if they don't understand how to answer the question, they're going to skip it if it's not required or guess. And that's ultimately going to create more work for your service desk later. So it's really important to remember that your consumers, your users, don't have the expertise that your help desk does in IT or your service desk team in HR has. It's really critical to make sure that you get users feedback as well to see if you're doing well on this as you build out your catalog. So we see that when you think about these five best practices, as you're creating your content, your knowledge, your catalog items, designing your self-service experience, if you follow these, you will have a more approachable, more effective, more desirable experience for getting your users back to doing their jobs once they come to Employee Center because something has disrupted their day. I will turn it over to Nicole to talk about some design thinking work. We, we do have a question, which I think is a Oh, good absolutely. One. So AB is asking, I struggle with the same issue as described in AJ's example of having 13 computer monitors listed with for X country only. Uh, and scripting becomes very complicated to achieve this for all their needs. Um, so um, AB is asking, can user criteria be applied to choice list on record producers to show or hide choice options? Um, I don't know the answer to that question. I'm sure that's something we can look into. The, the way we handled it at ServiceNow was that each of those monitors were distinct catalog items. And so the user criteria was applied to the catalog item. There wasn't a single monitor catalog item with a choice list. It was 13 different catalog items that each had appropriate user criteria for location. Exactly. So we're yeah, happy to follow up on this. Yeah, that's the one that even I would have recommended. Like, you know, you create separate catalog items and you apply user criteria on that instead of complicating your form and having like user criteria applied at choice level. Um, but we'll also follow up if there's any, any other enhancement. Any other questions on these before we move on? Feel free to raise hand if you want to. Okay. So Nicole, over to you. Great. Um, thank you again for having us. 
Uh, what the studio does, and this is going to be a kind of a brief introduction to really what design thinking is, but basically what AJ was talking about around kind of getting into that consumer mindset with inside our organization, I'm going to help you with maybe a couple of techniques. If you go and go to the next slide, please. Um, and what's called design thinking. So I'm sure that you've heard of design thinking and maybe some of you have been practicing for a while. But we like inside of um, in our practice, we like to call it a practice because design thinking really is like doing a yoga practice or anything else where you're doing something repetitively to kind of learn through and to be able to have more tools in your toolbox. So I'm going to give you a brief introduction to design thinking. And then at the end, we have some resources that might actually help you if you're interested in learning more about the practice or the journey. So let's go to the next slide. So we're calling this like design thinking 101. And the practice around design thinking um, is really this in a nutshell. So it's about going wide, diverging, and then getting more choices, going complex, and then narrowing down to make good decisions. And when we do design thinking, we like to do it with groups. And you might already be doing this right now using an agile or um, agile practice within your groups. But really, this is the motion. And it's a very simple concept. And it's really um, a more of a framework than anything else. So this is what was called the diamond, right? This is what the, the, uh, the initial design thinking process is. And Service Down and didn't make this up. This is a practice that was actually developed in the 1970s in banking and has been used in technology for a long time. So if we want to go to the next slide, please. What happens in design thinking is that it's a double diamond. So this is how we go through a process and this shrinks or expands and it's iterative as you go through. But really it's about this idea that you go wide and you get a lot of things to make decisions. Then you define um, those, you vote, you do things as a team to get to one place. Then you go wide again, once you've made that decision to co-create what you're trying to work on. Then you vote on your favorite answers and then you narrow again. And what it is is about a journey of going wide and narrow and wide and narrow so that all of those ideas can come out. And as a group, we're able to make good decisions. So when we do design thinking work with customers, we like to do it with about um, eight to 10. You start to get a little unwieldy when you get into the 20s, but it's about you can make things happen. It just means you might need a little bit more time because one of the most important things right, is in I think I, Oops, sorry, was that a question? Um, well, what's really important in design thinking is that we are getting everybody's voice heard, the democratization of ideas so that we can actually have good conversations about narrowing and move along the journey together. So next slide, please. Um, why design thinking actually works is because it's round structured group thinking, and that helps us gain alignment and because we're all working together and maybe somebody that needs their idea to be heard, they're heard, but then we're all agreeing upon something to move forward and to, to move through the process. And you might have been doing this already, and I'll, I'll show you a, 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 a technique, and that's what the, we're going to close out with. But it's about gaining alignment. What we always try to do is get diverse groups in the room. So as we're talking about gaining alignment around a concept or an idea or moving forward, like you're trying to reimagine something in your new employee experience, you'll want to get different stakeholders in the room or different groups of people so you can get those diverse groups of people to kind of work together so that you get a better solution. The more different types of people that we have in our engagements, the better our solutions are as a team and you're making champions along your journey. So that goes along with that organizational change management, getting your employees voice into the actual process helps them champion your experience moving forward. By working lean and by working quickly and iterating often, you're gaining that strategic direction and saving time and money at the same time, because we're not, you know, especially in a lean process, you're testing prototypes before you go into those really heavy, heavy development cycles. Those are expensive. 
So using things like AJ will be talking about later with card sorting, getting those user feedback, testing something, and then iterating. That's what we're talking about here in design thinking, as well as that iterative model in Lean UX. So next slide, please. One of the, this is a technique that you have access to that we've formatted for you for this particular um, session, but this is a technique that we use all the time. And this one really is about kickstarting, about gaining alignment, about at understanding what we've done so far. So it's a really simple retrospective activity called Anchors and Wins. And you may have already done this, but you maybe didn't know what was the strategy behind it. So I'm gonna quickly walk through, if we go to the next slide. Um, oh, it looks like we have a raised hand. Do we want to, uh, does somebody want to ask a question there? Yeah, I think it was, yeah, let me just unmute, allow to talk. Peter, you, are, you should be able to unmute and talk. I can't hear anything. No, so that, I, sorry, that was just an accident. Not a, oh, okay. I, just, I have a question. I apologize. No worries. No worries. Happy place for making mistakes. So, uh, but do you have a question while you're here? <laughs> no, I, I love this theme though. I, I came I, in a different job. I had a similar concept. I've not seen it in print since then. So this is great. Great. So let's just, I'll kind of walk you through this really simple exercise. And what you can, you'll find out is that Really, these exercises are about giving us the room to innovate. Sometimes it's really nice to give ourselves permission just to be able to think differently and not be so tied down to, oh my God, I've got to make this idea work. This is so, this is going to be, have to be scaled right now. Let's just work on it lean, test a concept, get into theories, say, I have an idea, let's work on it as a team, let's iterate on it quickly. So when we sprint with a customer, we use the Google design sprint methodology. And generally you're trying to get from idea to test in a week. Ours take a little bit longer because we've moved to remote, but in general, we are getting, going from idea to a test something within six to eight weeks. And that means about 20 hours of time. So if you're working within your organization, you can lean this up even more and do it even more quickly. But it's about testing and getting this idea out. So this alignment jam, um, and there's a link to some videos on other teams using it, uh, a, a group called AJ and Smart. We use them as a resource all the time. Not our AJ that's up there, but a different group out of Berlin. Um, this is one of those messes we use all the time. And there's lots of different versions of the same thing. So it doesn't need to get stale. There's anchors and winds using a boat metaphor, but there's also another one at the end of this called Rosebud Thorn. They're retrospectives. They're just asking people for more information. So we're using the same double diamond. And in this, um, it's showing what a workshop would look like. So I have here the workshop slide. And then after that, when we move through, you'll actually see that there's the, um, the different activities that are listed in here. But what this is doing is we'd like to get that diverse group of people. And maybe this is about using your employee experience. We want to create a better experience for our, for our employees. Um, and it's bringing that group, diverse group of people together to say, here, um, you know, let's move to the next slide and you can actually see the anchors and winds activity itself. You do a line and above the fold, you're saying what's currently working in our employee experience. So you get all of these different groups to actually put sticky notes in there, not talk about it. It's very, very important that we work alone together. That allows every person in the room to be able to come up with their ideas and thoughts and put it above the fold. And then we do a round robin and we share. And that's important too, because what we really want to do is hear from their voice, what they're saying. And in that, they'll usually say something different than what they're actually writing. And we write that down, we get that on the board. So we sometimes cluster when we're talking about what's working because we don't want to get rid of everything that's working. We want to make sure we're maintaining what's working. And a lot of times in order to get um, people talking, it's much easier for them to kind of think slow down, talk about what's working first, then we go into the negative below the line. What's actually holding us back from our goal? So what's holding us back from having that great employee experience? You get all of their thoughts from that too. 
From there, what we do is we organize and we cluster those into concepts or um, different principles or different words so that we can kind of categorize that. And then you, from there, what you do is you do the ideation phase. So you go wide again, you do ideas around how can we make, you based on these themes, how can we make it better? So these are those divergent and convergent cycles um, that come together. And these are the activities. I'm going to pause right there and see if there's any other, if there's any questions on this little bit that I've talked about so far. Okay, so what I'm going to do, we can just kind of quickly walk through some of these other slides. You can have access to them. And as you will find out, or as you will know, it's like this may feel a little overwhelming, but we've put everything in here to kind of write it out for you. And once again, this is, we didn't make this up. There's more activities at the end. So this is about brain writing. This is people working alone together on those sticky notes and kind of how that works. Next slide, please. Um, this is just how, you know, some how to's on how to cluster and theme. We can move to the next one. I'm gonna do, do these kind of quickly. You'll have access to this. This is one of the key things in design thinking is taking negative concepts and moving them into a place for ideation or for us to be able to think. So that's why it's on a converge. When you take something negative and you turn it into a question that allows you opportunity, that is gives people a space. So you can say maybe one of your problems in your employee experience is we don't have visibility into the process, let's just say. Then you say, how might we create more visibility into our process? So that's a nice wide question that'll allow us to be able to come up with lots of ideas, sending emails, having a, a pizza tracker. You start to get into allow everybody to kind of think, these are those places where no idea is bad. You go wide, every idea is good. Even if it seems silly, take it wide, let it go. After that, after everybody's had a chance to put on that green hat and to share, then you can start narrowing on ideas, not bash other people's ideas, just narrow on the ones that you think are gonna be the most successful. So these techniques are gonna help move them forward and they're not easy. So there's a practice of even learning how to write a good, how might we, not too wide, not too narrow, those kind of things. And what I do with my family is we actually use a lot of these techniques when we're just trying to do things around the house plan a vacation. We might do an anchors and wins based on what worked on our last vacation. What would we love to have happen on our next vacation? Those kind of things. So any of these retrospective activities gives us a chance to be able to um, practice this uh, at home. And that gives us the confidence to do it in front of your peers or in your workspace. Do it in safe places first. So let's go through the next exercise. Um, and selection grids. So selection grids you can use for all kinds of things. And that's really just making two accesses. And then like we do impact over effort and you then you'd be able to start to put all these great ideas. What's gonna be, have the most effort or sorry, have the most effort and the least amount of impact. You just wanna get rid of those ideas. Like don't even worry about them. But what actually is gonna have a lot of um, impact and it's going to be hard. Sometimes those are those wow ideas that maybe need to plan now. Some of those ones that are going to be easy and have a huge impact, those are those high ROI moments that you as a team are deciding, let's do these first to get our low hanging fruit while we plan these wow moments. It kind of helps us organize. So there's lots of ways and you can find online different criteria to put on those XY access when you're organizing these thoughts. But then it allows us not to be um, focusing on any one idea, but as a team, which is going to work really well. And you can't, one trick to these, you cannot let a sticky note overlap. So you can't have two things that are in that high, high moment, or um, the, you just have to make sure that there nothing overlaps. You have to make decisions. So if we go to the next one, 
this is another one of those um, activities. I threw it in here because I think it's really, really helpful. As we get to the end of projects, I love to do a rosebud thorn or something just to figure out what working, what's not working, what we'd like to continue. And if you're working agile, you use this methodology at the end of your sprints. This is it. The, the exact same thing, but it's really that idea that we need to always take a step back after we do a, a plot project, no matter how fast or how slow, to really understand how what we've learned and how we want to move forward. Um, that's it for the activities. And if you want to go to the next slide, these are really just kind of, these are just some of the principles that design thinking supports finding the right problems, ideating, creating lots of ideas, democratizing your ideas, and then prototyping and iterating quickly. We love prototyping. Get feedback on paper before you start. Get it something out in front of those employees to even prove that your hypothesis is going to work. Think of it as science and as fun, and then you'll be able to start moving forward a little faster and you're not so tied to your own ideas being perfect um, every single time. So if we want to move to the next slide, I'm rushing through. I want to make sure AJ has enough time. So, oh, there's an animation. We'll click on that one. <laughs> when to use this, keep going. Um, once again, this gives us better alignment. Maybe it's on our workspaces, it's on what's working, what's not working. We can focus it into a specific workflow. These can be as wide as you want them or as narrow, but you know that the answers are based on how you frame the problem and the, the theme of that um, workshop. Um, I say do this anytime. You can do does design thinking at the beginning of a process to kickstart it when you're reimagining, when you're trying to solve something really tight. Uh, and then the last slide for my part of this is a list of some of the resources that we love. So this is about service design. Check out these resources. Right in the middle is AJ and Smart. They do the Google Design Sprint methodology with Jake Knapp, the author from um, Google. And what they do is there's these training modules. They've got great videos just to kind of get you into some of these activities. These are some of the other resources that I thought maybe it might be fun to look through. But these are a lot of the resources that we use um, on a day-to-day -day basis to find new activities to do with um, teams that have that divergent and convergent philosophy so we can keep our activities um, up to date and interesting with um, our teams. So that's it for me. Thank you so much. Any questions? Thanks, Nicole. Any, anyone has any question on design thinking or the techniques that Nicole was presenting? Okay, um, Nicole is still around for the um, for the rest of the presentation, so please ask your questions in Q and A panel. And uh, let's start diving deep into the taxonomy piece of it. Um, to begin with, I do want to just you know come back to the thought that what is the taxonomy? It is often not very clear. Um, for organizations and what exactly is the purpose for this taxonomy. So the purpose for the unified taxonomy is to create an employee-centric browse experience. And I, the example that I often use is, if you are going to, uh, let's say, a, a big supermarket, the way you navigate your shoppers is not necessarily based on how you are stocking the store. It is based on what they have in their mind when they are searching for, for things to buy. So for example, if the shopper is searching for, let's say they have a dish in their mind, like I want to make pasta, your pasta aisle should have everything related to pasta, everything from utensils to ready-made pasta to ingredients and so on. And that's not how you would potentially source uh, or stock your, um, uh, stock your store for all these different things. The same way, your taxonomy is how employee is searching for content, whether that is a catalog item, article sourced by uh, IT or HR or anyone who is, is fulfilling that service. They don't have all these different categories in mind. They are thinking, I need help with benefits or I need help with hardware uh, and, and so on. So use the taxonomy from that frame. And this is very separate from how your knowledge categories or service categories would be because those categories are more for how you're stocking the store or how you are creating that content. 
We do ship an out of box taxonomy and we highly encourage organizations, especially those who do not have the time to invest in a brand new or a completely specific uh, taxonomy for your organization, use the out of box taxonomy as a starting point. We have done a lot of research to make sure the terminologies used in it are um, there's a 70 to 30 percent. It's 70 percent there where employees um, are using um, to find content. So start with the out of box taxonomy. It's something that we highly recommend. Now, when it comes to the process or the best practice process for creating your taxonomy, the first step is understand what are we are delivering out of box. Um, and, and then we recommend doing a mapping exercise uh, to identify the gaps or topics that you may need to rename, create or modify to align with how your organizational terminology works. So this mapping exercise is typically on one side, you need to have um, your categories and the other side, you pick up your uh, out of box taxonomy and you're literally saying this knowledge category or this content item can fit in this topic. And you're just doing it across all your content. Now, if if you do not find that out of box taxonomy aligns with your organizational terminology or um, the taxonomy also essentially creates the verbiage that you want organizations to think about, uh, sorry, employees to think about when they think about their experience with the organization. So a lot of organizations like to align the taxonomy with the culture. In fact, even if you think about the ServiceNow internal portal, we have terminology around grow um, um, as one of the topics. So um, um, it's, it's very much aligned with how we are thinking about um, um, our own culture internally. So if you are thinking of a new taxonomy, there are a couple of techniques that we will walk you through. Um, one is card sorting exercise and a tree test, which we recommend you to do um, to ensure that the taxonomy that you're creating um, aligns with how your employees are thinking about or using um, to navigate through the portal. And ultimately, no taxonomy is meant to be static forever. We, we should review and evolve the taxonomy every one to two years. In fact, currently we are in the process of evolving the out of box taxonomy that we have shipped. It's been a year since the portal is out. We have employee center is out. And we have done a lot, added a lot more use cases on the out of box employee center portal, which, which makes the case that, you know, the taxonomy needs to align with what, where the portal is heading. So that is true in your environment as well. As you start doing more with the portal, as more employees start using the portal, you want to think about how the taxonomy should evolve um, based on where your culture is going, where the use cases are, and so on. Any questions on this? Okay, so I'm gonna hand it over to AJ to walk us through the, the techniques that I was talking about for coming up uh, with your own taxonomy. <clears throat> Thanks, Pooja. So if we think back to Nicole's language around the double diamond and diverging and converging, these two activities fit nicely into that model. So the first thing is, if we are saying out of the box taxonomy doesn't fit our organization's content, or we're bringing in a new group of content that the out of the box taxonomy hasn't considered, card sorting is a great way to understand how your users actually think the content should be organized. There are a couple different ways to conduct card sorts. There's ways to do them in person with actual post uh, index cards and physically sorting them into groups is very manual effort, uh, requires some work to document the way in which people group them. And there's been software based tools that have filled that gap to reduce some of the friction. And I mentioned some of them on this page here, so that you can conduct your card sorting online. Now, that doesn't mean you shouldn't do some of those sessions moderated where you're sitting next to the participant and actually watching how they organize the content, because when you do them moderated, you have an opportunity to ask questions, to ask them to narrate out loud what they're thinking, and really start to learn more about your users that may inform other decisions you make down the road. 
But because many card sorting decisions are made based on quantitative data, you want volume. You want a lot of participants to go through. So you can also send out a link and invite people via email to add that data layer, that kind of statistical significance level of data um, to make decisions about how to organize your content. And all these tools have analytics platforms as well so that you can analyze the results of your card sort. Uh, but it's a really valuable way to get your user's mental model of the breadth of content and how they might group them. You can do a closed card sort where you define the categories they can put content in. You can do an open card sort to learn how they might name the groups, the slight variations in the process. It's a really valuable tool to get insights into how you might organize those content items. Once you have a proposed taxonomy, next slide, please. The way to validate that this taxonomy is going to work is through an activity called tree testing. And tree testing, again, like card sorting, has technology tools, software tools in the cloud that allow you to run these studies. And the goal here is to say, here's my proposed taxonomy. Here's a set of proposed tasks I expect my users to go through uh, within this content organization. Are they successful in doing it if I only have them look at the taxonomy? So you're not judging the design of your employee center. You're not judging your fonts or your color choice. You can see in the screenshot on the right, you're really just navigating the names of the categories of the topics from the top level all the way down to see if they successfully find the right answer to complete that said task. Hopefully you have high success and that gives you confidence to, for your rollout. But if you identify a task that keeps failing, what you might see in the data is everybody goes down the same wrong path. And that might say, oh, okay, maybe this item is organized into the wrong category. So now you start converging on a specific taxonomy by getting validation from your users. Um, we at ServiceNow use a product called MUIQ uh, from a group called Measuring Usability uh, that has all the ways in which we need to send it out to invite people to do a tree test, to analyze the results. But there are other products out there like TreeJack from Optimal Workshop, uh, UserZoom, uh, usertesting.com, I think, may even have uh, tree testing and card sorting tools as well. So there's a plethora of options in this space. Uh, the point is, get user feedback as you are building something for users. It's cheaper to get it early than when you're done and you have to redo the whole site. These are tools to help you build confidence in what you plan on implementing. Awesome. Thank you, AJ. Thanks, Pooja. And I also wanted to give you an example of like our own tree test that we are doing to evolve the out of box taxonomy. So um, everything like, you know, AJ was saying is, is how we have followed it. We created a, we did a card sorting exercise to come up with our new taxonomy that we are testing now using a tree test. And the place that I want to highlight is if you would see on the right hand side, we identified a, a set of use cases that we want to test in the uh, tree test. So that's that's one of an important exercise as well. Like you need to know what your important use cases are, um, and and make sure you're testing those in the tree test. Anything you want to add on this, AJ, um, on this slide? Yeah. So one thing that came up in I think the Q and A and earlier is usability testing. So usability testing is an evolution of the tree test in that you may use the same tasks. But now you're actually having them navigate through the actual web application. Um, Nicole earlier talked about prototyping and doing mockups. You can run usability testing on a mockup in a design tool. Like we use Figma at ServiceNow, and you can build a clickable mockup. Again, it's cheaper than building the whole web application and then finding out it doesn't work right. So these tasks here are very common uh, employee center tasks that an employee might go to. You can imagine asking users or participants in a usability study to do the same thing, um, but actually navigating the website and, and observing any issues they run into. They can't read something because the font's too small. They may have a navigation issue. The form might not be intuitive. That stuff starts coming out in a usability study that wouldn't come out in a tree test. Awesome. Thanks, AJ. Um, 
before we take additional questions, I do want to highlight some of the resources. One is um, we have a workbook. So if you are looking to use the out of box taxonomy and you want to, you know, start mapping it, but with your content, we have a taxonomy workbook, which is linked over here and is part of our now create resources. And then there are a couple of different uh, articles that AJ has published around usability testing and taxonomy development that we would highly recommend you to uh, leverage. All right, so let me just look at the Q&A panel and see if there's any that we can answer live. Um, okay, so Matt is asking, when using EC Pro, is it recommended to have a separate taxonomy for HRSD or is it preferred to integrate HR into a single main taxonomy? So our stance is that you should always have a single main taxonomy. There are often things that, um, you may associate as a service provider being part of HR, but the employee is going somewhere else to search for it. So um, you want to have, um, you could essentially have, if you see our out of box, we do have a, a parent topic which says HR, but the idea is it is still a single main taxonomy and you can have content that is part of HRSD appear in other topic areas as well. So you can have uh, one content item mapped to multiple topics. So have a single main taxonomy and, and have all your other departments who are offering services to the employees be part of that single main taxonomy. Okay. Um, Mark, do you wanna just go off mute and ask your question? Let me see. you should be able to do that now. Hi, hello there. This is Mark speaking. Mm -hmm. Hi. Um, yeah, I just uh, put a, a bit more technical question in the, in the Q&A and it's uh, concerning the con uh, connected content. Because when you are working with connected content um, in a live instance, you would do that directly in, uh, in production. Uh, but that actually causes um, yeah, potential issues. Uh, and I was wondering if that can be um, yeah, addressed with the de development team. So the, what we recommend is um, you, when you are experimenting with your taxonomy, use the sub-production environment to like do the experimentation in terms of what topics work, what where you would want your content. Um, and when you move it to production, you can use an update set to move it or, or um, or do that mapping in, in production as well. Typically, the content that we have seen is to be different in both the environments sometimes. So we don't want like the same mapping to be like just replicated in production. But yeah, we've heard of this and uh, um, um, there's a reason why we have that currently. Um, um, but yeah, I'll share that feedback anyway. Um, there is also one enhancement that is coming in February and a couple of questions I saw were related to that. Um, in our February store release, it will be tied with Utah family release. You will be able to associate new content that is published in a, a category connected to a topic uh, and automatically see that appear on the, on the topic management page. And it's, it's almost like in the related link section, you would see there's new content available and the topic uh, managers will be able to review the new content and then add it to the topic if it makes sense. So that whole process of making sure your topics are um, completely updated as the content is being created at the back end, we are simplifying that process. Do you have any recommendations on how many different taxonomy areas to link a request item? Can you have too many from a usability standpoint? And how do you determine the main taxonomy area versus the secondary areas? So I think what you're asking is how do we determine which one is a parent topic versus a subtopic and uh, um, how many uh, topic I should a request item be linked into? So the, and AJ add to my answer, I think, um, the main thing that you would use to determine whether something is a topic, <laughs> sorry, versus a subtopic is the uh, tree test. 
Yeah, I, so I'm trying to think about these two questions. So if you have a single item that gets connected to multiple different taxonomy areas, for the purpose of a user finding that one item in that one moment, that's probably fine. But what it does a poor job of is educating the user of where to expect things. So if I find item A in 12 different categories, it doesn't really teach me anything about where I should expect items like item A. So that would be the risk there. It's kind of abstract because the average user is probably not on employee center very often. Um, so I don't know if there's like, don't do more than two, but I would, I would not suggest having a single item in many topics unless it is directly relevant to those topics. Um, because it becomes a nightmare to maintain, I feel like, and it just doesn't educate them of, of really defining concretely that this topic is going to have this type of items and this topic is going to have these other type of items. So it feels like a slippery slope more than anything, Amisha. <laughs> On the second question around the main taxonomy area versus secondary, secondary areas, the card sort is going to be the best technique, I would say, versus guessing of how your users might organize content. Then you could do a card sort with multiple layers of categories. It becomes a little more complicated. Um, but if you see them building groups in the card sort that are very big, you can ask them to subdivide. That's what I would do if I was facilitating a session. And then the tree test would be used to validate that you got the taxonomy correct. So that's how those would fit into that, that answer. Awesome. Um, uh, we are almost up on time, but if there's any other question, feel free to raise your hand and we can take it. But other than that, thank you so much, everyone. Um, hope this was uh, helpful. We will have the recording and the slides posted on community and YouTube soon. And uh, a, a really big thank you to AJ and Nicole for um, running this session for us. Thanks so much for having us. Don't, don't end the, the session yet. I'm answering a couple more questions. Yep, 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 please. And if anyone else has questions, please put it in Q&A panel. We are here for a few more minutes. For those of you that don't feel like you had your question fully answered or we've been having a really interesting back and forth, post it to community so you can get perspectives from your colleagues and other customers, and we'd be happy to weigh in. So, Abby, on your whole conversation around um naming catalog items that are unique to countries but the same item i'd love to see you post that to community and then we can dive into this conversation further i would suggest to anybody else who doesn't feel like they have their question answered we're going to be keeping an eye on the community